Good morning, church. I'm Pastor Marty, pastor of Algonquin and Central United Methodist Churches, and I greet you on this, uh, the day the Lord has made. I rejoiced uh, when they said unto me, let us come unto the house of the Lord. It's been uh, this wonderful week. Uh, Tina and I had the opportunity to enjoy uh, the fireworks uh, this weekend. Uh, we uh, took the cruise out uh, and had nearly a front row seat uh, on one of the river boats and that was a, uh, a wonderful, wonderful sight. For some reason we missed uh, the Canadian fireworks, but I think one of the more clever lines we saw this week uh, happened to be on Facebook when someone said, can we see the Canadian fireworks uh, from here? And someone uh, replied on Facebook, no, they pull a big curtain down so we can't see them. But uh, we hope that your 4th of July was a blessed one and uh, we do give uh, thanks uh, to God uh, for our nation. Special greetings uh, to those of you who are watching online. Uh, a word of instruction uh, for you that if you have a prayer request, and if you're comfortable typing it into the comments line, please feel free to do so, and uh, I will share that uh, with the congregation. Uh, for those of us who are here uh, in person, uh, you have the opportunity to let us know of your attendance by filling out the attendance register. And likewise, if you have a prayer request that you would like to share, uh, you are invited to fill that out uh, on this card and to just put that uh, into uh, the offering. We like to begin our worship time uh, by sharing in our mission statement that can be found uh, on the front of the bulletin and I invite you uh, to read along with me connecting all people to God by building bridges of caring outreach and acceptance I invite you to stand uh, for this morning's call to worship Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, whose holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great ruler, within its citadels, God has proven a sure defense. For lo, the kings assembled, they marched together. As soon as they saw, they were astounded. They were in panic, they took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there, anguish as of a woman in travail. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God establishes forever. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. As your name, O God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with victory. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Go round and about, number its towers. Consider well its ramparts. Go through its citadels that you may tell the next generation. Our God forever and ever. God will be our guide forever. Our opening hymn this morning is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing in your red hymnal, page 400.
Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we gather in your holy presence, filled with awe and gratitude for your majesty. As the Psalms declare, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. You are our fortress, our guide, and our eternal joy. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune our hearts to sing your grace. May our worship today be a reflection of your abundant love and mercy. Open our hearts to your word and let our praise rise like a joyful offering to you. This we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen and amen. Please be seated. I'm doing a quick scan. I don't think I have any young people for, for a story. So I'll save that one for next week. And we'll go into our introduction into the first reading. In our first reading, the Apostle Paul talks about a man he knows who has taken to heaven and saw amazing and unspeakable things. He also mentions having a thorn in the flesh, a problem that kept him humble. Paul asked God three times to take it away, but God said, my grace is enough for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul realized that his weakness made him rely on God's strength, so he was glad to boast about his weaknesses because they showed God's power. First scripture reading, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 10. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Or because of these surpassingly great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Our next song is Open Our Eyes in the Little Black Hymnal. You may remain seated. Page 2086. Our second scripture reading comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, the sixth chapter, 
verses 1 through 13. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there, except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. The word of God for the people of God. I'd like to think that I possess better than average negotiation skills. And part of the reason why I feel that way is I grew up watching my dad buy a new car roughly every two years. He was under the belief, and in hindsight he might have been right, that cars just weren't built to last back then, and you needed to trade them off about every two years. So I grew up with a long history of varied station wagons with paneling on them. And I watched my dad hardball. He was a hard negotiator. He knew what he wanted to spend, and he wasn't going to spend a dollar more than that. As a matter of fact, I remember in one particular negotiation, he was going at it with the salesperson and the owner of the dealership came in to offer some words and my dad said, get out of here. Can't you see we're working a deal? And the owner of the dealership felt insulted, imagine that, of being thrown out of his own office. And so he walked in and he grabbed the sales contract that we had been working on and he tore it up and told us to leave. I couldn't wait to get home and see my friends. <laughs> Have I a story to tell you? And so with that in mind, in later life, I became uh, employed for uh, an insurance company whose name I will not mention. And as part of that, I learned negotiation skills because as a claim representative, you have to learn to settle claims. And so in the midst of all of this, and then add some college courses on negotiation, it was with great hubris that I went to a jewelry store one day to buy a ring for my daughter. And I knew that there was a lot of markup on jewelry. And this particular ring was about a hundred dollars. It was a hundred dollars or so. And I kind of said to my wife, watch this. 
and I used all of my skill, all of my talent. I did it all. It was a master class in negotiation. I'm sure if it had been filmed, I would have gotten an A. I was masterful. And I got that price from $100 all the way down to 95 <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And as that was going on, someone came out from in back who happened to be the store manager. I happened to recognize the store manager because long ago we had lived on the same street in Battle Creek, Freelingheisen. Note to self, never move to a street that you want to spell the rest of your life. So we lived on that particular street. And we would wave to each other. But as time went on, he began to know that I worked for an insurance company whose name I will not mention. And that because I worked for that company, I was entitled to some special discounts. And the reason for that is, as you might imagine, insurance companies have to pay a lot of claims out for lost or stolen jewelry. And so they've negotiated contracts with national vendors in order to get jewelry at a discounted uh, price. And as an employee, I was able uh, to take advantage of that. I was able to take advantage of a great thing, not because of my skill or lack thereof, I was able to do that because of my association, my relationship with that company. We may return back uh, to that. But once again, I saw before my very eyes a sale contract get ripped up, and I now got it for $70 instead of $95. There was a lesson to be learned there, and perhaps we'll hear it later. Well, this morning we have a curious mix of topics in our readings today. Paul talks about being humble. Paul talks about seeing heaven. He talks about living in weakness. And Paul talks about, in the midst of that, finding strength. And in our gospel reading, we find the topic of familiarity of unbelief, and it closed with a message of empowered, bold, missionary service. These are all wonderful topics, and I'm at a dilemma. I'd love to spend 15 minutes on each topic, but I don't think I should do that today. And so I want to focus in on a little bit from our gospel reading and then a little bit on the reading from uh, 2 Corinthians. Keep in mind that whenever uh, you are speaking from the pulpit, there are two things that you must do. You always have to have a word of challenge but you also have to have a word of comfort. And it's always this delicate dance of trying to find this way to work in words of challenge, of a poke in the rib, as well as words of comfort. But our gospel reading today is one that challenges me. And since I tend to preach to myself, uh, you'll have the opportunity to listen in because I see that the work of Jesus is limited because people have adopted this familiarity. They think they already kind of know who Jesus is and because they think they already have this opinion of Jesus, Jesus is limited by their unbelief and by their view of how they have boxed him in. 
There's a reason why I like to say I rejoiced when they said unto me, let us come unto the house of the Lord. That is an attitude of joy, of expectation, one that we all should rise and challenge ourselves to feel when we wake up on Sunday morning. We know the drill. Do you wake up and say, good morning, Lord? Or do you say, good Lord, morning? Well, in preparation for this morning's sermon, I came across some words from William Barclay, who was a Scottish uh, theologian. And they poked me in the ribs. So I'm going to share those with you. In looking at the story of Mark and how people were familiar, how people were in unbelief, William Barclay writes and he says, there can be no preaching in the wrong atmosphere. Our churches would be different places if congregations would only remember that they preach far more than half the sermon. In an atmosphere of expectancy, the poorest effort can catch fire. In an atmosphere of cold, critical coldness or bland indifferences, the most spirit-packed utterance can fall lifeless to the earth. When's the last time that we've asked ourselves, what atmosphere am I setting for the worship service today? Have I come with a spirit of joy and anticipation? Or am I critical and cold and indifferent? Barclay goes on and says, there can be no peacemaking in the wrong atmosphere. If those gathered together have come together to hate, they will hate. If they have come together to refuse to understand, they will misunderstand. If they have come together to see no other point of view but their own, they will see no other. But if they have come together loving Christ and seeking to love each other, even those who are most widely separated can come together in him. There is laid on us tremendous responsibility that we can either help or hinder the work of Jesus Christ. We can open the door wide to him or we can slam it in his face. Beloved of God, how did we come to church today? Did we come to be open? Did we come loving Christ? Have we come seeking to love each other? As if that's not enough, Tina found a book for me. She was rummaging through our basement with the leftovers of our rummage sale I always get scared when she does that. And she pulled out a book this thick of 14,000 quotes. And I thought, I can use that. And for this week, I found one, and it poked me really hard in the ribs. There are some whose faith is not strong enough to bring them to church services, but they expect that some that same faith to somehow take them to heaven. I think what we can learn from this passage in Mark is that we are to have a spirit of joy, of anticipation, and expectation that God is going to do something in our lives, in our church, in our community, in our world. Can I get an amen? 
one more time. I know it's hot. I know it's muggy. Even those of you watching, type amen. Let's hear it. Amen. So be it, Lord. Thus is our challenge. But yet we can also find in the midst of that challenge great comfort. And this is why I love uh, that passage in 2 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul, depending on which theologian you believe, he wrote up to 13 books of the 27 books that make up the New Testament. Consequently, Paul's a pretty big deal, right? And yet, when Paul speaks of his vision of going to heaven, he speaks as if it's someone other than himself. Most theologians believe that Paul is speaking of himself. But yet, Paul is speaking in a place of humility. And I think, oh my goodness, there's something to be learned there. Paul left his ego at the door, and he was a very humble person, sharing a message, and he wanted to be sure that the gist of that message was focused on the, what the message had to say and not on the messenger who was sharing that. I've told the story before that I attended a church that in its lobby had a, like a five, six foot tall oil painting of the pastor. Oh my, I want my picture in the fellowship hall, not in the entrance way, right? It's not about the pastor, it's not about you, it's not about me, it's about Jesus, and it's about the message and the life-changing message of Jesus. And Paul wants to make sure that he doesn't get in the way of the message. And what is his message? It's that joy and paradise unspeakable await the people of God. That eye hasn't seen, that ear has heard, nor has it ever entered into the imagination the things that God has prepared for those who love him. We have a lot to be happy and expectant for. One of my favorite lines from the movie Star Wars, the original one, is where Han Solo is trying to be recruited in to help the rebellion. He's played by Harrison Ford. And Mark Hamill, playing Luke Skywalker, is trying to entice him. And he's like, Princess Leia has riches beyond your wildest imagination. And Harrison Ford replies, I don't know. I've got a pretty good imagination. Well, no matter how good our imagination is, heaven is greater. And we can take comfort in knowing that. We can also take comfort in knowing that the work of God isn't dependent on our resume. We spend a lot of time thinking about what we don't have when instead we should be thinking about what God might be able to do with what we do have. A willing heart has no limitation when led by the Spirit of God as to its impact and its ministry. I know most of us tend to be like Moses. Here I am, send him. When in fact, God is calling us. And it's only natural for us to say, I'm not qualified. 
and here we do well to remember that God does not call the qualified, but God, call, but God qualifies the called. We are called to live and to serve, and with all that we have and with all that we don't have, Christians through the ages with all types of limitations have stepped forward to serve and God has blessed and multiplied in spite of those limitations. What's holding us back? Are we back to that place of unbelief? Be comforted in knowing that God's strength and God's blessings are actually made known through our weaknesses and not through our talents and our treasures. You remember the story I opened with where I used all of my great negotiation skills and got very, made little progress. But yet, when I was shown to be identified with that insurance company, a great difference was hap had, had took place. A better deal was there. Something I never could have accomplished on my own. Do you see the connection your relationship with Jesus, my relationship with Jesus, supersedes what we think we have and what we think we don't have. The Spirit of God can and will work in you, through you, in this place and in the world if you are willing to allow it. The disciples went and the world was never the same. Beloved of God, you and I might be the only Bible that some people read. That terrifies me. Not because of you, but because of me. But I also know of the power of God's Spirit. Don't worry about the cracks. That's how the light gets out. That's how people begin to see, wow, you're human too, and God's love and presence is upon you. And that gives hope for them. We may be weak, but in Christ, we are strong. May we rise to that challenge to come with all that we have, to come with all that we don't have, to come with an air of expectancy and joy and desire to grow in love of Christ and neighbor. And let's see just all that will happen. The best can be yet ahead. Amen and amen. This is uh, our opportunity uh, to share in the Lord's table. This is the Lord's table, so it isn't United Methodist table, it's the Lord's table, and the invitation is that Christ has called all who uh, wish to be in love with Christ and uh, in connection with their neighbor uh, to share at his table. And we partake of a process called intinction, which means I give you a piece of bread and you dip that in the cup and then you partake of it uh, up here. Uh, for those of you who uh, have need gluten-free, I do have gluten-free. 
Um, and I think I know who most of you are, but just let me know uh, when you come up and I can make sure that you get a gluten-free bread and a gluten-free uh, cup. Likewise, if, uh, if coming forward, if it would be easier for us to bring uh, the elements to you, uh, we will do that uh, after others have been served. So will you join me in this morning's communion liturgy? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall there be war anymore. And so, with your people on earth, and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. Jesus healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. And by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, Jesus gave birth to the church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, Lord, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen.
through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. In response to God's enduring love and mighty works, let us give generously, knowing that our offerings support the ongoing work of his kingdom. May we contribute with grateful hearts, honoring God with our gifts as we continue to praise God's holy name. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Heavenly Father, we dedicate these offerings to you in praise and gratitude. Use these gifts to further your kingdom and glorify your holy name. Amen. The next hymn is not one you're familiar with, I don't believe, so Pat is going to go through the chorus before we sing it. It's on page 505 of our red hymnal. Oh, and you may sit. <laughs>
please be seated we will be sharing some prayer requests and when I do begin praying I'll be praying prayers of petitions that will end in the words in your mercy and you'll be invited to respond with hear our prayer some prayer requests to pass on Nora was airlifted to DeVos Thursday with a ruptured appendix surgery went well and she should be home today so we're all's well that ends well there Mary has written traveling mercies for anyone traveling I'd ask for continued prayers for my brother Brad who begins chemotherapy on Monday he also did have a brief hospitalization this past week and just all of his numbers are down and it's a discouraging time for him and for his wife Cindy who's recovering from a hip surgery so your prayers for them would be greatly appreciated pass on a prayer request for Rylan Chaplin this is a student known to Seth Baker he went through a horrific automobile accident and if it could be broken battered shattered it was and remarkably he is recovering well and no sign of traumatic brain injury which was a great great concern in those early early moments and so we are very thankful to hear that in prayers for his recovery there I do want to pass on a joy you may recall Jessica Davidson our now international liturgist who shared with us from Scotland this past week she received an MBE which is an award from the King it stands for member of the British Empire and it is the third highest award that a citizen can receive from the King and so we rejoice with her it's in recognition of her work with victims of sexual assault and so we pray for her and rejoice with her as well in the communion of saints and in the power of your Holy Spirit let us lift our voices in prayer glorious God you bend down to wash the feet of your disciples let the servant church arise in our teaching our praying our healing and our doing make all your faithful people powerful in weakness and strong in grace in your mercy hear our prayers life-giving God your fingers trace the heavens and your hands mold the earth where there is drought bring nourishing rain where there is devastation from fire or flood bring relief sustain the well-being of every living thing in your prayer hear our prayer in your mercy hear our prayer merciful God you speak in the nations listen open those who govern to the cries of all who govern may they hear the cries of all who journey with no food or shelter particularly people fleeing violence and those seeking freedom and those in search of community Lord in your mercy hear our prayers glorious God you embrace your embrace brings wholeness to those who are troubled anoint all who suffer in any way with the oil of healing and grant them renewal in your mercy hear our prayer welcoming God in your presence strangers become companions and enemies become neighbors open our doors to those we have so easily shut out particularly people who are different from us or who are marginalized 
by church or society. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, in whose name we pray, sharing together in the prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Some announcements. Um, a little bird has it that Colleen is your birthday, so, and Nancy Kirkpatrick also. We do have an opening uh, for Family Ministries coordinator position, and please uh, keep that in, a ma uh, in your prayers. Next week, uh, we have a salad uh, luncheon after uh, the worship service. And uh, I hope that you are able uh, to come and to uh, participate in that. Are there any other announcements that we need to uh, give highlight to? I have in the bulletin that it was the 14th, but do we have salads down below? There are salads. Okay, so there's salad downstairs. Come enjoy salad. Yes, all right. I really want to try to uh, come up with a, a salad pun, but let us continue. Uh, our closing hymn is hymn number 569. We have a story to tell the nations. I invite you to sing. Uh, and to stand uh, and lift your voices in song. <laughs> 